Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me um, wherever you are today uh, listening to uh, this, uh, this lecture. Um, I'm uh, the Senior Independent Director and uh, member of uh, the chapter at Lincoln Cathedral, a lay canon at Lincoln Cathedral. And um, I really want to welcome you to this sixth in the Lincoln Cathedral lecture, lecture series. Um, what we're really asking is, is how can common good theology really help us all uh, play our part in a in a spiritual and civic renewal and and we really appreciate at Lincoln Cathedral uh, the partnership with Together for the Common Good. Um, it, it's part of our wider Lincoln Cathedral Common Good project and we're really helping us to develop and think and build on our own civic and social engagement and today's lecture uh, was a topic at our own chapter meeting. We talked a lot about what it is that we need to do differently and more of to make a real difference in our engagement strategy as part of our sort of real transform and thrive. And it's actually in our sort of strat strategic document about how we drive this forward. So uh, timing is absolutely perfect and we're delighted that you've joined us today. So Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Mark. So we're really delighted to be partnering with you to put this <laughs> series on for Lincoln Cathedral. But these talks are for everyone and there's to help us reflect on how God calls us out of our current malaise in this society to a, a pathway towards spiritual and civic renewal. So whether it's about the economy or work, nature, freedom, politics or social peace, we're in a time of profound change. And so we're featuring speakers from different traditions, all of whom draw on Catholic social teaching to explore how Christian theology can be a blessing on public life. And so the recordings for the first five are available online at togetherforthecommongood.co.uk and the next three run between now and November. So I have to announce at this point that unfortunately, John Crudus is delayed in parliament. He's caught up in a three line whip around the immigration bill, 15 votes, which he can't get out of. So we're incredibly grateful and delighted that Lord Glassman, Maurice Glassman has generously agreed to step in and speak for us this evening. And Mark will introduce him in a couple of minutes and we will reschedule John's lecture for the autumn. But before we get started, I would just like to thank CCLA who are hosting this this evening and sponsoring this series. They're our longtime partner, an amazing supportive friend of Together for the Common Good over many years and helped support my uh, work on this series of lectures. And CCLA is the UK's leading sustainability fund manager for charities, faith and public sector organizations. So we'll be taking questions later. So if you're watching on Zoom, <coughs> please use the Q&A function, or if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, do enter questions in the chat. So Mark, over to you. Yeah, so I'm really delighted and actually honoured to introduce Lord Glassman. Um, Maurice Glassman is a, is a life peer in the House of Lords and, and the founder of Blue Labour. Uh, he's also the director of the Common Good Foundation and professor of politics at St Mary's University Twickenham. Morris is one of the leading figures seeding a, a growing cross-party consensus around economic and civil renewal. And Morris's expertise encompasses over a decade in Parliament, as well as a history in grassroots community organising. Um, and he's instrumental in the original campaign for the living wage. I think Morris may touch upon it, but I know that he is um, starting to work in uh, Grimsby and look at what activity we can really drive forward there. So, but Morris is personally rooted in the Jewish tradition. Um, his politics, remarkably, are shaped by Catholic social thought. He's recently published Blue Labour, The Politics of the Common Good, which sets out his vision for a renewed political economy. And it's that combination of factors that make him uniquely well-placed to help us all think about what is happening to work in the context of statecraft in a way that is aligned with the Judeo-Christian worldview. So Maurice, the opportunity and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, thank you very much. I barely recognise myself there. <laughs> um, I really appreciate it. I also uh, went up to Lincoln. So first of all, I'll just begin with, with, some, um, with some thanks, uh, first of all, to to Jenny for all that you do uh, at Together for the Common Good. I'm the director of the uh, Common Good Foundation, so it, it would be really poor show if we couldn't find a way of working together, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and I really appreciate I really appreciate it. And John Crudders is my really, I would say my closest friend in politics. So he rang me up today and he said, I've got a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
And I said, haven't we all? And, uh, <laughs> and he said, yeah, but I've got a three-line whip. And I said, so have I. And then he said, yeah, but you're in the Lord, and it don't matter. <laughs> so um, I didn't really have a comeback for that. Um, so um, I, John says he's going to get here as, as soon as he can. He also has written a paper, so that will be, I hope, um, later. I'll try to to keep to the topic, but um, more broadly, I want to talk about uh, Catholic social thought um, and how and how it's um, an absolutely essential part um, of of building a new politics. I'll talk more about that, but I also look around the table and realize, wow, it's I've been doing this for quite a while now, and it's really <laughs> I'm now looking out at. Uh, uh, really old friends, and it's it's very good to to see you all. Um, you know, I'll begin with you know just just uh, three reflections before I get into the heart of the matter. Um, the first is always for me, and uh, Paul mentioned it is that discovering Catholic social thought really transformed my world. It transformed my um, faith, and it transformed my my politics and particularly um Rerum Navarum, Laborum Exochens and Chantesimus Annus as three encyclicals. I mean really all the blue labor is is trying to make those articulate those at this at this moment the idea that we are fallen beings um susceptible both to virtue and to sin, I think is an absolutely essential starting point that the institutions that surround us are decisive in whether we go one way um, or the other it is vital. Um, it's a Dominican thing, you know, um, going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the the idea that we're social beings, the Aristotelian inheritance, the idea that we find the meaning of life in our relationships and in our work uh, are absolutely fundamental. Um, the articulation of the of the common good within that is, is is central. And I'm thinking here we have here the old alliance of the Salvation Army and the Catholic Church that was the very very origins of the labor movement with the Dockers strike. And if you read the articles around that time, the horror with which it was greeted, this idea that the Dockers should be paid was minimal. But what caused enormous outrage in the editorial pages and the letters pages of the Times was the idea that the Salvation Army is a Protestant organization and Cardinal Manning fronting it up. It was William Booth and Cardinal Manning the idea that Catholic and Protestant could work together was genuinely greeted with horror. That's the radical nature uh, of Catholic social thought, but it was Cardinal Manning together with Archbishop von Kettler in Germany, who actually were the driving forces for Rerum Navarum and the birth of Catholic social thought. So it's a source of it, um, enormous importance to me that the origins of Catholic social thought were driven in the in our politics, in our society, uh, and our ours. And um, obviously, they've been madly neglected, but there really is no alternative than to return to excavate those, uh, those origins. Um, and that's particularly true, although I won't labor the point, so to speak, about my party. Um, the second uh, thing that's put is to Speak, we're speaking here from the City of London. The City of London is the oldest continuous democracy, democratic city, self-governing city um, in the world, founded by the Romans. It has a very um, odd place because it preceded Parliament. You know, in the Norman Conquest, the conqueror basically laid waste to the rest of the country, but he got to London and he stopped. And that was because the city of London, you know, had 5,000 men in a militia standing at the gates waiting. It wasn't, and he came friendly to London and didn't conquer it and allowed English to be used, allowed um, common law in the courts. It's the very 
origin of the pushback against the conquest, the whole concept of the ancient constitution is rooted in the city of London. And you can see through its institutions, you know, the Guild Hall, where you won't be able to find a single worker. It's a banking association now, but that used to be a source of uh, moral economy. Um, and essentially, with a, a really hugely important self-governing city that then was entirely conquered by capital, became the absolute central address for, for the domination um, of capital within the framework of the Maritime Empire and the, and, and the British Empire. So it's important to remember that outside the City of London, you know, they call it City Hall, but it is, it's the Greater London Authority. You know, it's a, you know, City of London has what, 150,000 inhabitants and it's got over 100 elected representatives. The GLA, by contrast, has more than 8 million people and 16 representatives. I just say that if central to this is, is the idea, um, I think that we have lived through a period of time and its roots are very deep where money has exercised dominion and uh, democracy has been subordinated to that and certainly uh, what Jenny refers to um, as the kingdom. And, and the third thing is, you know, to Pope Francis said that we're not living through an era of change, but a change of era. And I think we've got to take that to heart, but our politics may seem flat, mundane, and technocratic, but the profundity of the change is, is very real. And we must get into position to understand that change, not to be overwhelmed by fear in relation to that, and to be able to develop a politics um, that is commensurate to the scale of the changes. Uh, and I, you know, what I advocate very much is that in, is in our thing is that we move from from contract to covenant in the way that we think that that's the essence of the uh, biblical political economy and it's the it's the very essence I think of of Catholic social thought that we recognise that we are bound to each other in association through thick and thin and we have a much more durable um, institutional system. Um, because uh, capitalism is fundamentally based on on this idea of contract, of the idea of an exchange between hands um, of equivalence. And what we've found is that leads to um, huge inequalities of power, huge inequalities um, of, of wealth, and we need to resurrect uh, more durable forms um, of association. And I think that, um, you know, London becoming a city would maybe be a good place to start in, you know, beginning to, to think about um, how our inheritance is distributed because the city of London has inherited all the ancient liberties, all the assets of 2000 years. And London as a local authority um, just has to, has to make do with, with what it has. So, you know, there, there's, there's my, Thank you, and I just want to talk about when Pope Francis talks about living through, um, not living through an era of change, but a change of era. What are the forms? What are the new forms that we have to recognise? And and the first is that the era that we have lived through for the past, let's say since 1979, let's give it a date and say that it commenced then, it's still not over. Um, but it's definitely on the rock. So we call, just call it an era of globalization. Let's say that the technology knew no borders. Technology knows no limits. That national borders were increasingly irrelevant. That they, it was good that there would be a free movement of capital, of labor, of goods, of services, that, uh, that this was all um, in the public interest. And that era has come to, to, to an end. So, you know, I'm not talking, I know that mental health is very much on people's minds, but when I talk about a bipolar world, 
I don't mean it in the mental health sense, I mean it in the sense that fundamental to globalization was the idea that capital would transfer its assets um, to China fundamentally and other areas in, in Southeast Asia. But China, so one of the great ironies of history is that the most successful enduring communist regime was the most hostile to labor. There were no free and democratic trade unions, that's disallowed, no freedom of religious association, that's also disallowed, but China could guarantee 24 hours production without any disruption from strikes. That's what China could offer with an educated workforce that did not participate in any way in the governance of the economy. So China offered the dream of frictionless returns to capital. And capital duly relocated to China. And we saw, you know, so when I'm talking about the change of era, we can't ignore what happened with the Brexit vote, for example. And for me, the Brexit vote was fundamentally driven by the dispossession and abandonment of our working class, that they had no real role in this future. <laughs> they were called lots of things. They were called the left behind. That was the nice term. But essentially, they were seen as an archaic remnant of a previous civilization. So when we talk about the change of era, um, the first point about the change of era is, is that it is now the case that the state, the nation state, will play a far bigger role in the economy than was previously thought. Um, does, does anybody remember COVID? Does anybody remember this period? It was, for me, a, a very interesting, it was the first time in my living memory, do you remember, it only lasted for about six or seven weeks, but suddenly we, what was invisible to us, which was work, um, human labour, suddenly became visible. Suddenly, there were those of us who could earn a living behind a computer screen on Zoom, and there were those of us who had to leave the house and do things for others essentially with their hands. Um, those were truck drivers, those were shelf stackers, those were uh, nurses in hospitals who were who were dealing with the sick, like those were street cleaners. Suddenly, do you remember, we started applauding people for going to work. It was a, it, I thought that was a very, very significant moment, but of course passed. But what it also revealed was the incredible dependency on what they call extended supply chains and that we couldn't even make face masks, you know, let alone respirators, let alone medicine. Suddenly the incredible dependence on China for a very brief period um, became quite scary. So one of the effects of that has been um, and it's long-standing that the state will play a bigger role in the economy and the working class, far from being the left behind, the abandoned and the dispossessed, are the decisive force now in elections. So the next election, just to tell you, will be this contestation for what they call the Red Wall. The people who voted for the Conservatives in 2019 and Labour desperately need to vote for them um, at the next election. And that will be the essential um, battleground of politics and these places. And this is the important thing, is that the globalization place didn't matter. Place didn't matter at all. Um, you could participate in the economy from wherever you lived um, due to the internet and technological changes. Um, but in politics now, place is very important. And um, this is our friend, um, as I'm now going to um, I'm now going to uh, talk about this, which is um, it, the growth areas in the economy are very much related to what you might call relational work. So huge increase in people employed in social care, care for the old, huge increases in people who work in schools, working as teaching assistants, um, working with people with, with mental health problems. In all those areas, I even hear that in the city, I don't know, Andrew, at lunchtime, you have 
personal trainers come and take people for where they used to just get drunk and eat long lunches. They take people for intense runs and keep their fitness up. Um, a huge explosion, um, but it's completely disorganized and it's contracted out and it's low paid. I mean, did you see the, the case? It was just yesterday that a teaching assistant got stabbed in a school in a school playground and I was looking into it. And it turns out that the teaching assistants aren't in the union, they don't have representation and, and all these things. So there's a, you know, when we talk about the people that we really depend on, their wages are, are have been pushed down. Um, their, tra their training is extremely scanty. And I think in Catholic social thought, we do have the idea, Jenny spoke about calling. I, I also think that the concept of vocation is worthy of retrieval. And because we are social beings, to go back to the Aristotelian inheritance, Catholic social thought gives incredibly importance to association, to people associating with each other. We've seen the complete atrophy um, of association, um, but it is necessary for this to be resurrected, I think, in order for that dignity to be restored and for people to be able to participate in their working lives um, with dignity and with some power. So we've seen this, you know, this, you know, we've seen the emergence of a bipolar world. We've also seen the really strong emergence of a bipolar labor market where there's extremely high rewards for professionals, for, for finance, um, for tech. And then when it comes to the substantial economy or the real economy, the care we give to others, um, there's very low wage, very poor representation um, in that. And we've also seen, which I think is also needs to be rethought, um, the abandonment of full employment as a goal of, um, of politics, because I think ultimately in our inheritance from the scriptures, work is a fundamental way in which we realize our creativity, our partnership with other people, and the transformation of our inheritance, the transformation um, of the world. I used to get into a lot of trouble, Paul, you will remember this from early Blue Labour days. I used to get into really terrible trouble um, in the Labour Party for publicly associating with the church, with faith, because, of course, it's patriarchal, sexual abuse. It's just horrible, um, essentially. And I used to say, yeah, well, at least people of faith don't think the free market created the world, you know, that there's some prior and substantial inheritance. And I think that that's uh, worth remembering. So why, why is it that I'm so wedded to Catholic social thought in terms of statecraft and in terms of the political economy? Um, and it's fundamentally, um, because Catholic social thought is the most practical secular guide to the problems that we have and how to begin to think of a political and inst institutional solution to them. So the first thing to understand about globalization is it was fundamentally based on the fungibility and dehumanization of labor. That any worker could be exchanged for any other worker. If you didn't have workers here, you could bring them in from abroad. I saw yesterday that the Dutch government fell because of issues relating to immigration, that this whole um, low paid workers, disintegration of solidarity um, is a fundamentally important uh, political topic, but the fundamental insight of Catholic social thought is that there is such thing as class, that there is a relationship between capital and labor, that it says that labor is the living element. Um, I can't stress enough how labor and exergence is the most profound work on human labor, on human work, that I think has been written in the last hundred years. <laughs> and it talks about the realization of the person through their labor, the fulfillment of that, the relationships that are essential, the notion of a vocation which is passed on, an inheritance in, the, uh, in relation to the um, dignity of the person and how capital 
is an enormous threat because what is capital? Capital is an accumulation of inherited wealth um, that has become committed to the highest return at the greatest speed. In other words, it's by de definition exploitative. So what is necessary is to have countervailing powers to that that can retrieve and restore the dignity of the person and particularly of the, of the worker. Um, so the dignity of labor is vital. That's done in Catholic social thought as we have inherited it through a concept of vocation of vocational colleges. Um, it is one aspect of that, that, that it's done through trade unions of building association and trade unions as, as necessary associations in order to limit the dehumanization of the individual worker. And in that it teaches us something about sociability. You know, whenever I meet people and I ask them why they're doing what they're doing and they say, because I want to make a difference, my heart weeps and it bleeds because you can't do it on your own. You've got to do it through fellowship, you've got to do it through association, you've got to do it through building institutions and democratic institutions um, with other people. So that's the, the, that's the first and primary reason why Catholic thought is that Catholic social thought still believes in the value and importance of labor of the human being so labor is just another word for the human being and the relentless exploitation of the human being and they're turning into a commodity so this is where i see the the contemporary political stage is that in the period of globalization everything was a commodity right so i'll just give you some examples that we're living through now water we just allowed our water to be privatized and subject to foreign ownership prices it's it's been commodified now what is commodification commodification is the process through which sorry it's gone seven so i'm allowed to use a really horrible long word like that but commodification is the process through which something that was not produced for sale is turned into a sale that is open a commodity that's open for sale on the open market so you know the human being obviously is a miraculous expression of love but in the labor market it's treated as a commodity water is a necessity of human life absolutely central in the bible the heavens the earth the prayers for rain philip that we regularly you know this is a matter of now it, it's a commodity heat energy all these things were considered best organized within the private sector best organized through markets best organized through prices and now we're dealing right now we're dealing we're reaping the whirlwind of all of this but catholic social thought does not say nationalize <laughs> catholic social thought does not say centralized state ownership catholic social thought has a much more sophisticated approach to to this and i would like to go through that now so it's not only that the in catholic social thought that the human being is has dignity and that the laborer is to be respected as a partner with capital in the organization of the political economy and not subordinate when it's a partnership that's a reciprocal uh, relationship between capital and labor but the second principle of Catholic social thought, which I think is is equally significant, is, you know, bad word again, but it's past the witching hour, is subsidiarity. It's decent, the power should be exercised at the lowest level commensurate with function. In other words, the place still matters, that association matters. And within Catholic social thought, I think it gives an opening space for thinking about how we can have locally organized civic trusts, responsible for water energy we used to have to remember the water boards on the, the but things changed after 19 after 1945 the central state 
So I would say 45 to 79 was the period of the centralized state when the failures of that grew to be on the control of the politicians. That when we, that's when we entered the period of globalization, which would date from 79 to now. So now in our politics, we have to find a different way. And I think Catholic social thought opens that way and the importance of decentralization, of subsidiarity, of local participation in the governance um, of the economy, as well as politics, are absolutely vital. So you have status, the status of the worker, then you have subsidiarity and decentralization, which I think are vital. And then you, and then you have solidarity, which is the responsibilities that we have, the obligations that we have to each other, as bound by association and all the different forms of voluntary and involuntary associations are vital, but it ultimately means that there also has to be a redistribution um, from rich to poor in fundamental ways, um, which doesn't mean that the poor don't have responsibility. They, they do for, the, for their good work, for their effective work, for participation, but solidarity is the third concept that binds people together in covenantal association. And then there's the stewardship of nature. You know, the idea that, as I say, that the free market did not create the world, that we have an obligation to treasure creation itself. Because if you think of it like this, then capitalism is, is something quite nuts. Capitalism wishes to see the commodification of creation. <laughs> the creation itself. And you can see that in the aggressive resistance to any form of faith in the economy or in politics that any, because they wish to absolutely own uh, creation and to dominate creation. And so the resistance to that, um, I think comes from um, human association and as I say, Labor makes a chance and Chantesimus on us are absolutely superb. Um, looking at my lot from Leviticus 25 to 35, you know, in the Bible it says that when you lend, you must keep the person company. <laughs> the, 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 the Kesef Tolva is the Hebrew, is that you but this is not a transactional relationship between the lender and the lendee, but this is a way that you create relationships. But the existing system we have and the banking system that we have leads far more to the disintegration um, of relationships and no obligation um, when it comes to um, the reciprocity between the rich and the poor or the bank and the and the customer. So this is the reason why the human person has to be put. This is the paradox I always say, that citizenship will be redeemed by faith. The, the rationality alone cannot, um, cannot up, uphold this. Jenny, I'm asking. Okay. Well, I've got, um, there, there's, there's much more to, to say about this. But I'll move to, to the, the conclusion, really, um, of the talk is, is that we have to recognise the stark realities of where we find ourselves in and in terms of people of, of faith, where, where we are, is that our voice is increasingly marginalised in politics and, and within the and within the economy, but not as marginalized as the poor. But, um, there's a huge crisis at the moment, I think, in the party system. I sense no enthusiasm anywhere in, in, relation, in, in relation to that or any, um, <clears throat> or any agenda that, that could conceivably take us in a different direction. I think it's our responsibility um, to develop, um, to develop those things, and I, and I, you know, and to understand how desecrated the human being has become within the prevailing system. So, in the economic system, treated completely as a fungible commodity, in the welfare system, treated as an isolated unit and a cost, 
the disintegration of the traditional you know institutions i i say here to the to the salvation army and to the catholic church if you were to have a support for the dockers now how many people would come the reality is tens of thousands of people walked out to protect the dockers and to uphold the dignity of labor how to renew that association how to renew the relationship um with 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 the poor is essential and we have to look at the the menace the menaces of poverty the menaces you know that's where i came into this into this world i know some of you remember covid does anybody remember the financial crash of 2008 that, that was uh, something um i think that was the beginning of that move that led to Brexit, but you know that that was the beginning of the disaffection with the prevailing consensus. Um, but we have plenty of work to do to establish an alternative consensus. Um, but the menaces are also about surveillance, about compliance, about bank accounts being terminated because people don't like the politics of the person who holds the you know a really strong system um, of corporate control um that that needs to be um resisted uh, i do have i do have um i'm just going through now a kind of listing is is the so I, I will conclude with three points um the first is that we can no longer think about the economy as separate from politics so what we have witnessed in the era of globalization is two things the first is, which is obvious, which is increasing power of the market, that the market has increasingly penetrated into all aspects of life, that the price system is the dominant system for the allocation of resources and goods, that there is a commodification of human social life. But equally, there's been an increase in the power of the state that the state is the other institution, not only in terms of coercion um, and enforcement, but also in terms of welfare. So you have a very strong market and you also have an increasingly strong state. But what has disintegrated in all of this is the third aspect, which is society. And that's the, so if you could say that the principle of the market is contract and the principle of the state is redistribution, move taxation to the center and then out again, then the principle of society, which is reciprocity, which is relationships, has disintegrated. So any agenda coming from Catholic social thought has to put association at the very heart, the restoration, no less, or you could even be melodramatic and call it the resurrection of society. Now that's really hard work. That's, you asked me earlier, um, Paul about Grimsby, building a community organization in Grimsby. Now, just to let you know, it's, you know, I'd like to say it's a very nice place, but it's a very tough place. And the reason I chose Grimsby was because it has the lowest levels of literacy, it has the highest levels of abuse, neglect within its public institutions. And I thought that, you know, the least of these have to lead, you know, but this is another really fundamental principle that I took from Catholic social thought that we will find leadership from the unexpected places, from the most abandoned places. And we're beginning to see that we're building a community organization there. And the whole goal of it is to restore society. So it's not to stand for any elections, it's not to run businesses, it's just to hold the political and the economic powers, the, the powers and the principalities uh, to account through relational power. That's the idea of, of what we're doing there. And to restore that old alliance between the church and labor, you know, between those two factors um, in, in doing that. And it, you know, that's why I mentioned Cardinal Manning, that's why I mentioned William Booth, and that's why I mentioned 
the dockers because that was also a society that where the state and the market were completely dominant and society itself restored some <coughs> some balance so i think we can take some inspiration um inspiration from that so the importance of organizing um but to return to the theme of tonight and i really hope john gets here soon um is that central to Catholic social thought and central to the politics has become is to restore the dignity of the worker through association, through vocation. I try to give give this talk tonight without talking too much about stats because I found that if you mention stats, people tune out. But I'll give you two. Is that if you look at the last I got this from um it's public it was published in American Compass, a guy called Michael Lind, who's an American economist who's very sympathetic to the work that we're doing. And if you look at Britain and you look at the United States over the last 50 years, and I refer you to the to this report in American Compass, over the last 50 years, real wages have increased about 1% if you look over the time. Corporate profits have increased by 185%, right? I don't really think I need to say too much more in relation to this, but when we're talking about a common good, we're not talking about the domination of labor. We're not talking about unions running the country. We're talking about a restoration of some reciprocity in the rewards of the working life and in the way those are distributed i could go i could go on but also to look at another statistic is that in 1979 when i went to university um seven percent of people went to university and 50 percent of people had an apprenticeship now because god likes to mock us 7% have an apprenticeship and 50% go to university. The absolute atrophy of respect for skilled labor. And this is linked to all the other things that we talk about, the necessity of immigration and all these things are all rooted in the lack of recognition of the fundamental importance of work in the reproduction of society in the reproduction of relationships within society and a sense of justice within that, that all contribute and that all benefit. I think I'm done. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, thanks ever so much, Maurice. Uh, that was uh, that was that was fascinating. Um, and uh, I suppose I should declare my hand to, to you as the speaker as well, is that as a former MD of a global bank, I remember 2008 really well. Uh, so that was, a, that, was a, that was that was a fascinating time. Um, but for those of you that were uh, making notes, I, I thought your definition of globalization uh, from that era since 1979, uh, that frictionless return on capital was just was just absolutely on point. So uh, th thank you for so, so much for that. Um, but we are moving to the Q&A section of the proceedings. And remember, for those of you that are online, you can submit your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom or on the chat on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, but before we open up to questions, I'm actually going to sort of use my prerogative as the co-host to sort of Ask a question and, and make a make a couple of um, couple of thoughts. Really, um, I, I thought it was fascinating when you talked about the growth areas. Um, I thought it was really interesting in that journey from moving from contract to covenant, um, and and it was really reassuring actually because I sort of pulled out the cathedrals transform and thrive, which is our strategic direction, and. Um, when I look at what you described as those Catholic social thoughts of dignity and respect of labor, place matters, association matters, and stewardship of nature, I look at our priorities, which is about our staff and our volunteers, the dignity and respect of labor, um, place matters, about being inclusive, a sacred space, um, association matters, which is all about the inclusivity, um, and then the stewardship of nature, we've got an explicit, which is a net zero of 2030. So it's great that as a cathedral and as a community, but my, my question really is, you, you, you talked about that relationship power of church and labor. 
what are the what are the simple actions that we should be taking now as churches cathedrals places of worship what, what are the actions that you'd be recommending that we took now to make a difference okay so remember what i said about making a difference <laughs> so you're on your own yeah. So the most thing, I'm not just going to be having here. I was just yeah. getting, close, I was getting yeah. closer to you, Paul. To uh, yeah, Morris, Mark, it's it's Mark, yeah, it's Mark. it's don't worry, yeah. uh, it's much. Yeah. At least I haven't yeah. called you John. So um, the no, uh, it's it's good. it's much better behind it's, the mic for me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you know, too many churches, Mark, John. You know, <laughs> um, forgive me. No. Um, I, I, I misheard from the from the outset. So. You know, for me, the 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 centrality is to build relationships in the places that you are. So, you know, you know, one of the nightmares of of progressive politics is that it completely ignores the relational and goes immediately to the agenda. You know, so the way I put it is ignores Marvin Gaye's question what's going on and go straight to Lenin's question of what is to be done. And we all know how that goes. And the most important thing that anybody can do, and, and that I try to practice in my life, is to talk to people that you live with and that you work with and to build friendship with them wherever you are and to hear what they say. Because what I find is, is, is that Essentially, the the lives of the poor are still despised, and their views are still despised. I remember, and Paul, you remember early days with Blue Labour. We started doing, um, we started doing some organising work within Labour in in working class areas, and the response of the party mm -hmm. when they, you know, they said, "Well, we're worried about immigration," and the party said, "No, you're not." It's cuts, it's austerity, you know, this inability to listen to what people are saying and the desire to not talk to them anymore once they begin to speak. It's really vital. The most important thing is to build enduring bonds of solidarity with the people around you without paying too much attention to the agenda because the existence of the relationships is transformative of what you can do, but it can't be pursued the idea is not to use people for your pre-existing agenda. The idea is to build relationships. Now, what you will find when you do that, and I can speak here from experience, is that, is that people want the good and people want love and they want meaningful work and they want some sense that they're recognized in this world. It's really, and, and it will come out um, in a form of political economy that they want a decent place to live and a decent job and some security in that but don't rush to it <laughs> you get i mean so this is the point that catholic social thought gave me it is is the human relationships are transformative that love really is possible in the world but the existing system of power and money try to disintegrate those bonds and try to disintegrate the possibility because talking to people is very time consuming. You know, it's very difficult actually having a conversation with someone and finding out where they're at. What did you do today, darling? Oh, I had a couple of chats with some poor people. Well, you know, get to work, uh, but that is the work is. So mm. as you ask that question, that's the, the best yeah. is not to promote an agenda, but just to reaffirm the possibility of human fellowship and love in the world is the most radical thing and the most enduring thing. No, no. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll hand over to Jenny. But thanks, Moise. My pleasure. So we've got a few questions. Oh, yeah. I mean, no. um, this first question is, with increasing secularisation, how do we move to a, a world where our economy is run according to Catholic social teaching? Often people are sceptical of whether the ideas of Catholic social thought can actually gain real political traction in such a highly secular context. And yet there are politicians like you and, and others from across the country who are drawing on this body of thinking. Mm -hmm. So what it is, what is it that unites you and that 
makes you convinced to give it your energy? And what small steps can we take to help nudge it along? Okay. So I, I think we, you know, I'm going to make a bold statement. I think that the big 20th century political ideas have run out of road. We're living through the the end times of all this. Um, as I say, um, state-based socialism, you know, has to account for for its sin, you know, and that sin is palpable in Eastern Europe under the communist system, but also in systems of neglect and lack of accountability that were created in our country. I think that the self-love, greed, I mean, Mark, the 2008, just the degree of lying that was going on about investments, about accounting, these are all to be reckoned with and the human suffering and the and the sin involved in treating people as commodities in exclusively being concerned for your own wealth and not for the for the well-being and flourishing of others okay so what i'm saying to you clearly and this is palpable to me in parliament is that neither do you remember, and now this is something that's going to be difficult to remember. Does anybody remember Liz Truss? Does anybody remember that particular? Don't forget that, that Boris's thing was going to be, there's going to be a new political economy. We're going to pay workers more. We're going to have levelling up. We're going to decentralise to the regions. Right? And so then you had the Liz Truss restoration, which was supposed to be Thatcherism, and the markets chucked her out. You know, the markets chucked her out essentially for lowering taxes and and all of that. So that's been rejected. And now we've got what I consider is entirely bankrupt political leadership still trying to tinker with a system that's fundamentally um, failing people in the fulfillment of their family life, in their everyday life, in their local life. So the, the issue is on us. How do we articulate and how do we pursue um, a, a politics that's faithful to our faith, that is loving and open to all to participate uh, and to share the fruits of that? So, Jenny, I don't, it, mm. it, we don't have the problem. They've got the, pro you know, the problem is, is that, Free market capitalism and state socialism have both been revealed as absolutely inadequate means of governing a society. Yeah, I'd like to come in with another question. Yeah. So when you talk about countervailing powers and new forms of association, yeah. in relation to the workplace, can you give us an idea in practical terms of what you mean? Are you, are you talking about new forms of trade unions? Or are you thinking about workers' guilds? Are you talking about forms of governance, accountability? What, what actually might that look like? Yeah. Okay. So the very superficial answer is all of that. Okay. So um, for, first of all, in terms of the governance of economic institutions, there's various ways. Of, one aspect would be called for governance reform, where you have the representation of the locality and of the workforce um, on the board, so that these interests. I mean, I noticed with particular grief in relation to. I, I really love. You know, these, these are one of the things. I really love my football club, which Loughlin knows, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, which is also an incredibly rapacious capitalist organisation. So you, it's this weird thing. You've got all these millions of fans who love the club, and yet they have no representation, and they just announced another 20% increase in the ticket prices. Um. But this is all the imbalance of power. It's not just about workforce. It's also about fans and the things that we love. So corporate governance is one um, working on with Philip Ullman, who's here, this concept of civic trusts, which will be accountable to local people through public assemblies in places. Um, it's almost back to Roman and Greek forms of accountability through the, through the tribunes. But the whole many many examples of this in in the bible of local assemblies holding holding institutions to account i think that it's absolutely vital i mean 
we've just managed to bring Unite into relationship with uh, the community organization in Grimsby. It's It's been a story, but it's also to renew a concern that unions should have with the local, with the places that their members live, as, as well as the workplace. And, uh, and that I think is a very effective way of addressing the decline um, of that. But above all, when it comes to the social carers, when it comes to the teaching assistants, when it comes to these new forms of relational work, vocational colleges and guilds. I mean, if you look at Catholic social thought, so key assumption in Blue Labour is the old is the new. There is there are places performed. So I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one anecdote that really interests me. Um, a few years ago, I gave a talk at Labour Party conference, and I called for the establishment for half the universities to be closed down and to be turned into vocational colleges. But the doctors and the lawyers and the dentists and the accountants should be put in the vocational colleges because they weren't essentially academic disciplines. They were vocational practice was was the core. And the next day I got legal letters from the BMA, the Law Society, <laughs> um, saying that if I continued with this, they would take legal action, <laughs> which I found um, really very interesting. So. Um, let's just say it didn't go down very well at the time. But the important thing is, is, is that, you know, that's what's got to be challenged. The idea that a guild, these are guilds, the BMA is a guild that protects the professional interests of its workers. So I think it's really important, the concept of a self-managing guild system in social care um is vital and that's to be combined with an uh, effective union that can deal with employers in relation to uh, conditions of work so these are completely compatible ideas i'd like to move on to this idea of welfare to work because the vision you're describing needs to i mean it needs to take into account we currently have nearly five million people on out of work benefits and just going back to a, a quote from Pope Francis, where he says that financial help for the poor must always be a provisional solution in the face of pressing needs. The broader objective should always be to allow the poor a dignified life through work. Now, skeptics might say that's all very well, but it's not practical in this modern economy that we're stuck in this provisional position because the problem is intractable. But from a Christian world view, obviously it's an unacceptable, even an outrageous position to park people on benefits you know, for three or four generations and families, for example, as we have in many parts of the country, um, where we've had capital flight, where historic, you know, jobs and manufacturing have gone. So how does that shift happen in realistic, practical terms from welfare to work? What kinds of training, what kinds of jobs, what kind of local investment frameworks will actually work to make that happen? It's been tried and it's sort of failed, isn't it, in the past? What was wrong with the way it was done before? Well, it was completely individualist. Um, that was that was one aspect. There was no component whatsoever of vocation, of relationship. You know, it, it's the it's the, that's what I mean. The restoration. You You're know. saying because it was very centralised, because it was a government top down initiative rather than doing it. And it was, you know, we've got to add a caveat is that we want to move people into meaningful work, not just any work. So that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Vocational training, relational welfare, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and this is very... So when you say consuming. relational welfare, you're talking about neutralised models, is that what you're talking that's about? That's one aspect, but also, as I said, with the banking system, mm -hmm. is that you establish an individual relationship. And um, Philip's done really good work on this in, in the Netherlands with social care, where you have 12 person teams and they care for the same people so that the people see the same people time after time. They're not just, you know, I don't know what you're, I don't go to the doctor anymore because I don't know my doc, you know. You go in and they, they don't know who you are or what you are. This this whole system has to has to be um, 
reorganized in that way. So yeah, I don't think we've 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 tried any and it's also the understanding of work. I mean, what is you know, caring for children, caring for old people, this is this is by your sweat shall ye live. You know, this is this is the world. This is this is work. And how do we support those? How do we support people in their caring rather than exclusively move to institutionalization? I mean, we have another question here about AI and robotics. Yeah. So you know, there's a horrific idea of you know a robot caring for the elderly. So how, how do you see the, the changes in terms of AI and robotics in the workplace and the wider social consequences in terms of the dehumanizing yeah. and well, removal of relationships? I have, I have distinctive views on this and I'm open absolutely to, to challenge is, is that we were told that it was technological changes that meant we couldn't have full employment and it was technological <laughs> changes um, that meant that we had to invest all our, all our capital in in China, so essentially, I think that the that the working class have felt the fullest brunt of these technological changes. Although I don't think it was preordained that it had to be that way. The next step is going to be the proletarianization of the professionals. That the this is going to hit. So if you can fill in a form on the internet with your complaints and they can give you a diagnosis, that's going to be difficult for doctors. I think. The legal, you know, essentially the, the professionals are not going to be able to protect their domain in the way that they used to be able to protect their domain. But ultimately, no robot, they still haven't got a robot that can tell the difference between a dog and a cat, let alone your mum. You know, the, the, we tend to get a bit apocalyptic about it, but what we see is a steady growth of employment that involves human relationship. Now, and what I'm saying to you is this is good. This is very good for us, but it's to give those human relationships dignity and respect as a form of vocational. One okay. last question. Oh, please. So when I was thinking about this lecture, it really struck me as astonishing, that given the scale of the change in the nature of work, that there's been so little pushback you know, against these pr profound changes these insecurity in work, wage, wage stagnation, conditions. And so I hear you saying that it's the loss of association. It's essentially the loss of, of individualism that's atomized us from each other, that's divided people from each other, the loss of solidarity. And what I hear you saying is this is actually caused a concrete result. The result is that there's been no pushback against all these changes. It's almost as if people have been sleepwalking into a new reality. Well, that's the nature of political consensus and that's the nature of ideology the ide ideologies are there to tell you that there is no alternative to the way that they are working that's the fundamental power do you remember tina there is no alternative so we closed down the mines we deindustrialized. there was no alternative and suddenly we woke up as i say halfway through covid and saying china oh my god you know this, this but it it wasn't visible and it was seen as inevitable that the market was the most efficient way of distributing resources. Nobody really, uh, um, after 1983, uh, disputed disputed that. So, but it's not just individualism, Jenny. It's also collectivism. Mm -hmm. Is that either you do it yourself or you elect a new government that does it for you? Mm -hmm. No, I would say that what Catholic social thought has given me is the idea that if you are serious, you build relationships and institutions and associations with the people that you live and work with, and you you have a great freedom to, to do things with that. So, yeah, it's not just individualism. And then you asked about yeah, increasing secularisation. I just want to respond very briefly to, yeah. uh, to that is... And this is just to share with you. So even the most secular people have a sense of the holy, of the sacred. So, for example, I spent some time with environmentalists and they are really aggressively liberally secular, but they do think that nature is sacred in some, that we're violating it in some way. Um, and, you know, th there's something going on with this trans debate and feminism where feminists are saying no I'm a woman you know that that's um 
that's something that shouldn't be violated and that's something that's sacred. So I've gone from thinking that we're living in an increasingly secular to an unconsciously kind of inchoate sense of the sacredness of things that's being done. And, and so it's just to apprehend where people's sacred is and to build coalitions and not to forget the beauty, the strength of and the blessing of the inheritance that we've been given through our faith. Thank you. That was a pleasure. Mark's going to take over at this point. Yeah. Hi, Morris. Um, thanks thanks ever so, thanks ever so much for that i um so a couple of three things maybe um firstly you've really helped me with a a talk i've got to give on uh, saturday morning to the diocesan synod so um uh, which is all about building relationships between the cathedral and the wider diocese so uh, guess what i'm going to talk about building bonds of solidarity the existence of relationships and uh, you know people want good um, and it's the time when you know there's always change in whatever organization at a time of change in you know in the diocese we we will find that really 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 useful um just one other bit that I thought, yeah, when you talked there about that sort of desire for that sacredness and whatever, um, I, I've always thought that uh, actually those people that publish books on mindfulness have actually just pulled up, pulled the wool over our eyes and actually Ooh. mindfulness and this, you know, go to an airport and see your books for mindfulness. That is just people who crave some form of spirituality or some purpose. And actually they've just... Yeah, they've tipexed out sort of various words and just sold it and made a few quid. So um, I think that piece about mindfulness and sacredness is, is really, really important. But um, it's been really useful. And, and, I, and from a Lincolnshire point of view and a Lincoln point of view, I, I really want to thank also, as well as yourself, Morris, I'd like to thank uh, to, Together for the Common Good. Um, this is really helping Lincoln Cathedral. I, I sort of waved around our strategy document, but it's really helping us think about how we engage more with the wider civic and social relationships with our neighbours in the city, but also across a very diverse, uh, very diverse county and diocese. You know, when you, whether it's from Skegness on the coast it, to Grimsby and Scunthorpe to Stamford and Grantham and places like that. You know, there's a lot of variety, a lot of challenges but also a lot of opportunities. And so for us, it's a really exciting opportunity to take the thinking that uh, Jenny and the team from Together for the Common Good are helping us and to then put it into practice. So thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Lord Glassman, again. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, CCLA again for supporting this series, the sixth one, there are more to come. And for those of you that aren't familiar, the CCLA is the UK's leading sustainability fund manager for charities faith and public sector organizations and it's got a long history of managing assets for christian organizations so the ccla also provides the secretariat for the church investors group helping christian investors really develop investment policies aligned with their faith so i just want to say thank you again to the ccla uh, we really appreciate your support thank you jenny thanks mark and again huge thanks to morris Thank you so much. Uh, a brilliant talk. I had I had no doubt yesterday when there was some doubt over this when um, Morris said I could have him up my sleeve that he'd be able to deliver it off the cuff, as it were. So really great. Thank you so much. Um, and you've shown us how dignified work is central to a civilised, fulfilled life and why work must always be at the heart of civic and spiritual renewal. In fact, the cornerstone of a politics of the common good. And you've shown us how properly understood Catholic social teaching is non-partisan. It transcends partisan positions. And, and that this framework, which is rooted in the gospel, requires us to be ambitious. Sometimes Christian responses can get a bit stuck. Responses to poverty can get a bit stuck, whether on models of charity or models of welfare. But without the dignity of work at the heart of that argument, these responses can inadvertently end up propping up an unjust economy. So we've got to be very careful about these politics of low, low expectations and not collude in this politics of abandonment. And I think people are so hungry for vision, uh, but crucially a, a vision that doesn't offer the false hope of a utopia, but one that's realistic. And, and I think Morris has shown us tonight that there are ways to move beyond this assumption that uh, there's no alternative, um, beyond this pervasive sense of, home, of hopelessness. Uh, towards a pathway that's something that is non-revolutionary, <coughs> stable, a form of statecraft that's practical, that puts families and communities first. In fact, it's good for business 
as well. It's good for everyone. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, we're going to reschedule the talk by John Crudders. You'll be pleased to hear, so you'll get two for the price of one. We'll get that rescheduled for September. And looking forward, in fact, the next one that is scheduled in the series is on Tuesday, the 17th of October, with Professor Alison Milbank, who I've asked to talk about people and planet, the common good approach to the conflicting interests between environmental concerns and people's livelihoods. Anyway, you can find out more about all of that uh, on the togetherforthecommongood.co.uk website and at the Lincoln Cathedral website. And I hope you'll join us for all of those. So all remains to say is thank you again for everybody's contribution tonight and good night and God bless. <laughs>